That song, King of Kings, I love that song. I don't know if you, sometimes we don't think about the words we're singing, but if you were paying attention, that's the story of the gospel in, as we sung and praise God. So praise forever to the King of Kings for all that he's done for us. We're glad that you're with us to worship him as we come to his word now. Will you bow with me once more and pray? Lord Jesus, you are our king, and sometimes we resist that. We don't want a king, or we want a different king. But as we lift our voices and and give you praise and worship that you deserve, your spirit reminds us that there's only one king. There's only one worth worshiping and bowing before, and it's you. So speak to us through your living and active word as we seek to submit our lives to your reign and rule. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer by putting your hand up, uh, but I want you to answer it in your own heart, in your own mind. How many of you have ever had the experience of uh, something happening to you, and you had the thought, what possible good could come from this? Anybody? Yeah? I'm guessing, uh, I won't make you raise your hand, because I, I figure every hand would go up. Or if, you're, if, if your hand isn't up, you're not listening uh, or paying attention, because we've all had some experience where something has happened to us, or we experienced something that was so painful, so dark, so just wrong, that you thought, this, there's no good from this. What possible good could ever come from this? And maybe people have said things to you like, oh, God works all things together for good. Or he has a plan. There's a reason for everything. And you thought, not this. Well, I want you to keep that question and that thought in mind because that's going to be, I think, at the heart of what we're going to look at as we continue in our series uh, by faith. If you're just jumping in or joining us, we've been in a summer-long series on Hebrews chapter 11. Now, just a little review. Hebrews is written to, can you guess? Yeah, Hebrews, Jewish converts to faith in Jesus living in the first century Roman world who were under oppression because there were protections in Rome for Jews, but not for Christians, which was considered this strange new sect of Judaism. And they're experiencing persecution and they're tempted to to shrink back from following Jesus as the Messiah and revert back to their, their Jewish ways. And the author is writing to them saying, don't shrink back now because Jesus is the one that you've all been waiting for. He's the supreme one. And he gives this list in Hebrews 11 of these heroes of their faith in the Old Testament. His, the genius of it is he's saying, these people you revere for their faith were looking forward to what you now know in Christ. So don't fall away. And it's remarkably relevant to us. And each, each little character sketch in Hebrews 11 takes us back to the Old Testament to unpack their story, which hopefully has been good for you as it has been for me. And there's another reminder, we were given a definition of faith at the outset of the series, right? Faith is the assurance of things we hope for, the conviction of things we do not see. It means to live with assurance and conviction now, even though we do not yet fully realize all that we hope for. To live with a a substance. Faith is not blind faith or in the absence of reason. It's living with conviction and assurance right now because of the the absolute rock-solid guarantee of what we hope for. That was true for the Old Testament saints, the people in Jesus' day, and for those of us who follow him today. That's why we read this book. That's why we study it. So what could be more relevant for us? What could be more relevant for you than to learn to live your life following Jesus in this moment with assurance and conviction at the deepest level of your soul? I don't know about you, but I really need that. I really, I, I'm tempted to, to waffle, to waver, to shrink back. Every follower of Jesus is meant to live this way, with confidence and joy. The Old Testament example we're going to come to uh, in this part of our series is perhaps, I think, one of the, the best and most remarkable examples of living by faith in the midst of very difficult circumstances and God using those to transform a life. It's the story of Joseph. Now, when I, my middle name is Joseph. My father's name is Joseph. My, you might think, you're married, your dad's Joe Frazier? Different Joe Frazier. Uh, when I was in trouble, Jeffrey Joseph, my mom would, I knew I was in trouble my mom said, Jeffrey Joseph, Jeffrey Joseph, you know. I never knew Joseph's story. Joseph, not the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Some of you might know his story from the musical. So with apologies to Broadway, very different. They get only a few things right. Joseph's story is, covers over 14 chapters in the, in the book of Genesis. It's a remarkable saga full of tragedy, brokenness, evil, sin, injustice, and yet God's hand right through it all. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. We only get one verse in Hebrews, and it might strike you initially as a very strange one. It did me. 
By faith, there's our series title, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones, period. What? Like, why is that the verse that I, like, uh, we're clearly missing something, right? I mean, some things, why not by faith Joseph uh, forgave his brothers? Why not by faith Joseph interpreted dreams? Why not by faith Joseph um, was falsely accused but yet did not repay evil for evil? Why not by faith Joseph rose to power in Pharaoh's court and saved thousands? Why this? Well, hopefully we'll have an answer to that as we go. Why talk about his burial arrangements and the exodus, which was a generation ahead of him? So you really can't talk about the end of Joseph's life, which is the, what this verse does, without getting into like what happened in his life that changed him and made him the man he was at the end of his life. So for those of you that are less familiar, uh, I'm going to give you a, a very brief recap on the Joseph saga. You can read this in, in, in Genesis 37 through 50. Joseph is the youngest of 12 brothers. Who was his father? Anyone? Who is Joseph's dad? Jacob. Don't you remember the song, Jacob, Jacob and Sons? Oh, I won't sing it for you. Yeah, anyway. Now, we learned about Jacob last week. Jacob had a father, Isaac. Jacob was the youngest of two brothers. And Jacob's dad and mom, it was a very dysfunctional family. They pay, played favorites. It wreaked havoc on them for a generation. You'd think Jacob, of all people, would know better, but he doesn't. Je Joseph is his favorite. And he's over the top about it. That's the coat of many colors in the ring. He favors his youngest son, and his older 11 brothers hate him for it. And it's a messed up family. Maybe you think, man, my family is so messed up. Take heart. Every family since, since Cain and Abel has been dysfunctional in some way. But God's grace can prevail. We see that in Joseph's story. The youngest of 12 brothers, the favorite of his father Jacob, sold into slavery by his brothers. Maybe your brothers picked on you. Maybe your older sister was mean to you. She stole your clothes. I don't know. They sold him into slavery, lied to their father that he'd been killed by a dead animal, or by a wild animal, excuse me, falsely accused in prison in Potiphar's house. Then he's released from prison because he can interpret dreams, goes to Pharaoh's court, falsely accused and imprisoned again, eventually rises to the second most powerful position in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, Egypt. Second only to Pharaoh. And God uses that position of his to rescue an entire generation of his family and clan from a great famine. So much in this story. Eventually reunited with his father toward the end of his father Jacob's life and his brothers. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21, toward the very end of the book of Genesis. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. There's a lot in this remarkable passage. Joseph has already saved his brothers and their families from a great famine. Jacob dies. And his brothers think, they're, th they're thinking like they would think. I'll bet Joseph is inviting his time. He didn't want to take his revenge as long as daddy was alive. But now that Jacob is gone, what protection do we have against his wrath, his rightful wrath? And so they come to him with a story. Now, we don't know if Jacob actually said this. I'm reading into the text a little bit, but it seems to me that they probably concocted this. Dad said, you have to be nice to us. It was his dying wish that you not wipe us out. <laughs> now I want you to notice something. They come to Joseph after the death of their father. The patriarch of their clan has just passed. And they beg Joseph for mercy. What is Joseph's response to this? Joseph wept. 
Why did he weep? Why did Joseph weep when they said, please, please have mercy on us? Notice how they refer to themselves. They, they do not call themselves his brothers. We are your servants. I think in this text, what we see is Joseph wants his brothers back. And they just, they, they don't even presume that. They don't, they don't trust his forgiveness. They don't trust his heart for them. They don't believe that he has their good at heart. That's why Joseph weeps. The relationship between Joseph and his brothers has never been right. It was marked in the beginning by Joseph's ignorance and arrogance as a young petulant, the youngest of 12, and their jealousy and hatred of him. Now it's marked by fear and shame and guilt. Joseph wants to heal that, restore that, undo that. But they only see themselves as his fearful servants. The way that Joseph responds in the next three verses is absolutely amazing. And we're going to see in these next three verses, Joseph's response is three, I think, uh, crucial elements of what it means to live by faith. We see actually a depiction of the whole gospel in the three ways Joseph responds, the three things he says in the wake of his brothers coming to him and asking for mercy. Derek Kidner in his commentary on the book of Genesis writes this, each sentence of this threefold reply is a pinnacle of biblical faith. To leave all the writing of one's wrongs to God, to see God's hand in man's malice, and to repay evil with forgiveness. These are all attitudes of a heart that has been transformed by grace. Let me say that again. To leave the writing of one's wrongs, all of it to God, to see God's hand even in the malice of people, and to repay evil with forgiveness. Those are three marks of a heart that's been changed. This is not the Joseph that was bragging about himself to his brothers when they sold him. Something's happened to this man. He's been changed. I don't know about you, can you look back on your life over the, however long you've been walking with Jesus and say, I'm different now. I'm not perfect. I'm, I still have issues. I still have some growing to do. But I look at myself when I was 21, when I was 18, when I was 30, when I was 40, and I'm different now because of what God has been doing in me, shaping me, changing me, a life transformed by grace. Three marks of a man or woman changed by grace, three characteristics of someone who lives by faith in a good God in the midst of a broken world. Despite all that he's been through, Joseph, uh, these three things are present in his life and heart, and that means they can be present in your life and your heart too. First, first get out of God's seat. The first thing. We ready? To get out of God's seat. Notice the very first thing that Joseph says in Genesis 50, verse 19. We'll jump to verse 19 for a second. Joseph said to them, do not fear. Notice what he says here. Here's the for am I in the place of God? Here we go. He's asking a question. And the implication of the answer is what? No, I'm not. Don't be afraid. I, I'm not God. Am I in God's place? Meaning what? I'm not going to exact revenge. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to punish. That's not my place. Now, practically speaking, Joseph actually was in the place of God. He had absolute power and authority over them. He's number two in the, in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, Egypt. Second only to Pharaoh. He could wipe them out with a, just a nod, a click of his fingers if he wanted to. So he, they, they, they know that. And Joseph refuses to use his power and his position to exact revenge or even to justly punish them. One of the fundamental themes of the Bible is that when we put ourselves in God's seat, things go wrong. Always. From Genesis chapter three right on down to your life today. When I try to get into God's seat of judgment, of control, of knowledge, whatever it is, I make a mess of it. I'm not qualified to sit there, and neither are you. Maybe you're thinking, well, I, that's fine. I, I agree with that in theory, but I don't think I'm God. So that's not really my issue. Well, maybe don't be so quick to give yourself a pass. Let me, let me talk us through three ways that I see that we put ourselves in God's seat most often. When we try to be our own moral authority, we're putting ourselves in God's seat. 
when you think you can decide, you are the arbiter of what's right and wrong for you and yours, you're putting yourself in God's seat. Are you really qualified to be the judge and jury of what's right and what's wrong, even for your own life, let alone the lives of others? In Genesis chapter two, God gives Adam and Eve, the first humans, one command, right? Like just one. You had one job, right? There's one rule. I'm just giving you one parameter. Do you remember what it was? Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. Everything else is fair game. I'm here for you. Look what I made for you. Just don't do this. And we couldn't even keep the one rule. Why? What was the first lie, the first deception? You know this, we talk about it all the time. The foundations of everything you need to know about the gospel are laid for us in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. God is not, you won't die. You'll be like God. He's holding out on you. You can't trust him. You know what's best for you. Don't let anyone or anything, even God, even this ancient, archaic, outdated book, tell you what's right or wrong. You're the best choice, of, you're the best one to decide and judge that. When, you, when we begin to think that way, we put ourselves in God's seat. I hear this all the time. Well, well, of course, back then in the ancient world, people could accept the Bible because, you know, they were, they were superstitious. What does Michael Scott say in the office? I'm not superstitious, I'm a little stitious. Right? <laughs> Like they, 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 were, they, were, they were fairly ignorant people. They didn't understand the things that we know now. But now we know that we cannot accept uh, everything in the Bible because so much of it is outdated. It's, uh, it's, it's archaic. It was written in a patriarchal culture. It's abusive. It's just wrong. And so some things are good principles, but some things are not. What are we doing? We're saying, I stand over this book. I decide what's relevant for me today. I decide which of these things, the principles that God has laid out, apply to me today. I'm putting myself in God's seat. To follow Jesus means, it says, means I, I may not always like it, but no, he's, a, he's over me. I'm not in his seat. He decides. And any time that you hear somebody say, or you say in your heart, well, now we know. Warning bell should be going off. When we absolutize our now, we're in danger of putting ourselves in God's seat. Timothy Keller writes, this is a huge fallacy. If we, whenever we absolutize our now, we put ourselves in the seat of God. So the question is, does God's word determine what is right and wrong for my life? Or does my culture determine what's right and wrong in God's word? Second, when we refuse to forgive, we put ourselves in God's seat. When you refuse to forgive, when you withhold forgiveness for someone who's seeking it, who's wronged you, you're putting yourself in the seat of God. I, I know what this is like. Well, they don't seem like they're sorry. I don't think they know how much they hurt me. They haven't suffered like I've suffered. I, if I let them off the hook, they might do it again. And on it goes. When you withhold forgiveness from another person, you're playing God. You're in his seat. Romans chapter 12, verses 8 and 9 says that we, we should not judge. Vengeance is, is, is the Lord's. Leave it to him. It doesn't mean judge right and wrong. It means passing judgment on another person. Ephesians 4, 32, the apostle Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ Jesus the Lord has forgiven you. My ability to forgive somebody is a direct representation of how much I know I've been forgiven. And I understand that God's in that seat of judgment. C.S. Lewis writes this about forgiveness and about this being God's seat. You knew he was coming eventually. In his amazing essay called The Weight of Glory, you must make every effort to kill the taste of resentment in your own heart, every wish to humiliate or hurt or pay out. The difference between this situation and the one in which you are asking God's forgiveness is only this. In your case, you accept excuses too easily. In someone else's, you do not accept them easily enough. As it regards my own sin, it's a safe bet, though not a guarantee, that the excuses that I offer are certainly not so good as I think. As regards another person's sin to me, it's a safe bet, though not a guarantee, that the excuses are better than I think. 
One must therefore begin by attending to everything which may show that the other person was not so much to blame as we thought. But even if he or she is absolutely fully to blame, we still have to forgive. And even if 99% of this apparent guilt can be explained away by really good excuses, the problem of forgiveness begins with the 1% of guilt which is left over. And here's the line that stayed with me all these years. To be a Christian is to forgive the inexcusable in someone else. Why? Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And if you can't get that, you're in God's seat. You don't trust him to deal with it. Proverbs 24, verse 29 says, do not say I'll do to them as they have done to me or I'll pay them back for what they did. It's not your job. Now there, let me just pause for a minute and say there's an important distinction I need to make between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiving someone does not necessarily mean you are restored to a right relationship with them. That, that requires something on their end, which they may never do. They might thumb their nose at you, forget, forget you, I don't need your forgiveness. They may never acknowledge they're wrong. They may continue in their abusive or harmful patterns. That doesn't mean you can't forgive them in your heart. It also, forgiveness also doesn't mean you have to continue to put yourself in a position where you're going to be harmed or abused. What it means is I'm no longer holding over them this anger and resentment and unforgiveness. I'm releasing that to God. That's his job. Just like Jesus offers us forgiveness freely at the cross, holds it out to us, but to be reconciled to him, what must we do? Repent, fall on our knees, and receive what he's offered to us. The offer is always there. So forgiveness and reconciliation aren't the same thing, but we gotta keep going. When we give in to excessive worry, we put ourselves in the seat of God. So when you decide, I, I'm the arbiter of what's right and wrong, I'm my own moral authority, or I, when you withhold forgiveness, and last, when you uh, w- w- give in to excessive worry, you put yourself in God's seat. Now you might be thinking, hold, hold on, time out. Just because I worry a little, or even a lot, that doesn't mean I'm trying to be God. Well, actually, and I wanna make a distinction between our worry and our need for control and people who struggle with a, a diagnosable anxiety disorders. I'm not talking about the same thing. But worry is essentially you saying, I know what's best, and I don't trust that God is gonna get this right. I know how this should go. I know what's best for my son, my daughter, my job, my friends, my family, my spouse, but I'm not sure that God is paying attention. He's gonna handle this right. If he's sovereign, he's sovereign, isn't he, friends? If he's in control, he's in control. And if you don't understand what he's doing, then why should you assume that just because you can't grasp it, that means he doesn't know what he's doing? Again, putting yourself in God's seat. It's saying, if I can't see a reason for why this isn't working out the way I think it should, then there can't be a reason. Really? The more I get out of God's seat, the better my life goes, without exception. Can you look back at your life and say that? The more you get out of God's seat, the better it is. The more I try to ascend that throne and say, I know what's best, I know how to control this, I know who deserves forgiveness and who doesn't, it never goes well. All right, second thing that Joseph does is gain God's perspective. He gains God's, first he he gets out of God's seat, second he gains God's perspective. This famous statement of Joseph in verse 20 is a profound theological truth. Look what he says in verse 20. As for you, You meant evil against me. This is what you meant. You meant evil, whoop, let's go back one slide. I messed it up, sorry. Go back, there we go. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. These these two statements, which you've heard before, this is a profound theological truth. How in the world can Joseph say this? How is it possible he can say you meant it for evil? And by the way, in case you're confused, it is wrong to sell your siblings into slavery. All right? Just want to be clear about that, right? That's bad. Don't do that. It's wrong to lie to your father. It's wrong to pretend your brother got killed by a wild animal. That's wrong. It's evil. God isn't pleased with that. You meant it for evil, and it is evil. It was. But God meant it for good? That's a strange thing to say. We tend to think in either or categories, most of us in our minds. We don't say it this way, but this is how we subconsciously operate. Either my life is going well, 
therefore God is good. Or, my life is not going well, therefore God is not so good. We wouldn't say that out loud, but we think that, we feel that, that infects our prayer life and how we look at the world. Optimists, God is good and people are good. Pessimists, people cannot be trusted and life is unfair. Either or. But Joseph's whole story, this statement and his whole story is saying something very different. Life is hard. There is evil. There is brokenness. There is injustice. And God is at work and God is good. If you've been through the rooted classes here at Chapel Street Church, you know one of the things on suffering talks about this. It's called double-fisted faith. In the fiery furnace, when they're threatened to bow down and worship false gods, right there they say, our God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we'll praise him, right? There's, there's wickedness and evil in the world, and God is good and at work. Can you hold on to both? Or do you have to let go of one for the other? Can you have a tight grip on both of those truths? There is real injustice and brokenness in the world. I know it from Genesis 3. The Bible explains why that is. And at the same time, my God is sovereign and good and at work, even though I don't always see it. To live by faith means to hold tightly to both realities. That's what we see in the statement of Joseph here. Even though it might take years, it might take decades, it might take centuries, it might be not until the last day of human history that God makes it right. He will. I may not see it. The whole story of Hebrews 11 is people who live by faith and were, or did not see what they hoped for. They're commended for their faith because they lived not yet seeing, experiencing what they longed for fully. That's true for us. We look backwards to the certainty of the cross, but we also long for his return to set injustice is right. That's what it means to live by faith. This whole story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph shows us that brokenness and sin and evil are real, and so is the goodness of God. We looked at Romans 8, 28 in our previous series uh, called The Greatest Chapter. I won't go into details about the theology of this verse. You can go back and rewatch that sermon if you'd like. But th- we, we quote this all the time, but it's, it's pointing to a story like the story of Joseph. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are, are called according to his purpose. His good, not our definition. Remember, don't get out of God's seat. You're not the arbiter of what's good and bad necessarily. His good and his purpose, not necessarily our agenda. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, wait a second, Pastor Jeff. If God meant it for good, that phrase meant it, maybe that trips you up a little bit. Does that mean he caused it? Absolutely not. Okay, well, if he didn't cause it, does it mean that he, he's, he's okay with it? That he lets it go? No, not at all. He hates it, and it grieves him deeply. It's never his will or his desire for us. Evil, that is. Does that mean that when we sin, our lives are kind of like on plan B? Like behind door number one is God's perfect will for your life. Ooh, you made a bad choice. Door number two, plan B, you know, it's not as good. And you might get to heaven, but it's going to be a bumpy ride. That's not how God works at all. There's no plan B in the gospel. Think about the brokenness and sin that led to the cross. What was, why was the cross necessary? Because we repeatedly do terrible things to each other. We screw up our lives. We reject God's law. We go our own way. The world is broken, and forgiveness is necessary. Grace is, is required Was that plan B? Did God go, oh, this whole garden thing did not work out like I thought. Okay, let's see. We'll try with Abraham. Oh, they ruined it again. I know. Plan B or C. All right, Jesus, you gotta go. Is that how it worked? No. It was the plan all along. It was God's plan to bring about redemption. There is no plan B. Christ Jesus was sent into this broken world And he was born into all the corruption and chaos of humanity as part of God's plan from before the foundations of the world. In eternity past. Do you you grasp what an amazing resource that is for your heart? 
Last, grasp God's grace. Notice what Joseph says next to his brothers and how it relates to the gospel message. He said, I'm not in God's place. Get out of God's seat. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He's got a different perspective on how the whole world works. And look what he says next. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now Joseph would have been an amazing example of human forgiveness if he had just said, I'm not going to punish you like you deserve. That would be what? Mercy. I'm letting you off. But he doesn't do that, does he? He goes far beyond that and says, not only am I not going to punish you, like, okay, go your way, I'm not punishing you. I don't want to see you again. I'm just letting you off the hook. He says, don't be, don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. All the resources that are mine and my position, I'm going to bestow on you. I'm going to make sure that you and your little ones, your family are provided for. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. Come underneath the shelter of my grace, he's saying. Do you see the gospel in this? The gospel message is not just that Jesus forgives our sin and we're on our own to try to make it right. It's that he goes far beyond letting us off the hook and showers us with his mercy and love, calls us sons and daughters, invites us into his family, gives us a place in his kingdom, promises us an eternal reward. Come underneath the, the protection of my grace. This is what Joseph is doing. You see, number one and two are necessary for number three. If Joseph is in the seat of God, he never gets here. Right? He can't do it. If he doesn't have God's perspective, he doesn't get here. Grace gives you the resources to love even those who've wronged you. But here's the final thing. The story of Joseph is not just an example for us to follow. It's a signpost. The whole story, the whole narrative is pointing us somewhere. And if you've been around Chapel Street for any length of time, you think you probably already know where. Where is it pointing us? Say it with me, out loud. Oh, come on, that was so weak and pathetic. Where is this story pointing us? To Jesus. Do you see it? In case you don't, let me read a few things for you. The cup of suffering given to Joseph was used by God to shape him into the kind of man that would save an entire generation. The cup of suffering given to Jesus was used by God to bring about the salvation of the world. Joseph was sold by his brothers for silver. Jesus was betrayed by his closest followers for a bag of silver coins. Joseph was falsely accused and imprisoned. Jesus was falsely accused and betrayed and condemned. Joseph was willing to forgive his brothers. Jesus willingly forgave even those who hung him on the cross. Joseph refused to put himself in God's seat. Jesus actually belonged in God's seat and gave it up willingly to come to us that we might have redemption and forgiveness and grace. The whole story of Joseph, Joseph is meant to point us to Jesus. Looking forward to a future promise. Now, let's go back and look at those, those verses. Why, why does the writer of Hebrews say Joseph's commended for talking about his bones in the Exodus? He's living in Egypt at a time when he and his people, his clan, because of his position, have favor. That's going to come to an end in a generation. There's going to be a new pharaoh, and things are going to go from good to bad to worse. And Joseph knows this because God has said it. And look what he says at the end of this story. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. As a symbol of God's future promise, it's going to take years. His brothers will be long gone. Exodus chapter 13 tells the story. Joseph is saying to his brothers, this place where you are finding favor and grace right now in Egypt is not the, is not the end of the story. The promised land is yet to come. Friends, this life that we're living in right now, this world in which we exist and are trying to build our, our lives and our careers and our families and our place in the world is not the end of the story. It's not our primary home. It's not even the place we fundamentally belong. We're placed here for a short period of time. Our true home is yet to come. That's what the story of Joseph is telling us. And because of Jesus, we live by faith in what he will do in the future. That's what gives us the ability to get out of his seat, let him be in control to get his perspective. I don't, I don't know how this all works out, but I know the one who does. 
and to, to understand grace, to forgive even the worst of offenses because that has been forgiven in us. Let's pray. Lord God, I know that we've only scratched the surface of this story. It's such a powerful story and it's your story and the truth is it's our story. We're so humbled that you would, by your grace, not only forgive our many sins and wrongs, but shower us with your love and grace and give us position in a family under the protection of your care and love that we don't deserve and we could never earn. Help us to live each day in this short life you give us, aware of your grace, seeing it through your perspective and never trying to take your seat because you alone belong there. We give you all the praise in your name, amen.